So no questions on homework? Okay. You guys will be able to, there's one chair up here if you want. Anybody else wants a chair? You can get the very comfy chair. exciting thing in the world, I understand. Um, but don't <coughs> lose points on definitions. Um, who remembers the four levels of data we talked about last time? <coughs> I like nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio, coolness. Which are the two that are more truly numerical? The ratio and the... Yeah, the interval ratio. The interval are things that are uh, data points that you can do what with? Subtract. Subtract. It kind of makes sense the word interval means from this to this. So subtracting tells you how far apart two things are. kind of goes along with the name. And you can't beat the word ratio. I mean, that tells you if you make a ratio and actually do it, that would make sense. So this, this operation would be division. What else does ratio have going for it, Devon? So division makes sense? Yeah. And zero means what it's supposed to mean. It's the absence of something. Cool. So if I go fishing and I said, and I caught this fish, it was zero inches long, it's another way of saying, I didn't catch any damn fish. It's the absence of fish, right? You with me? But if I say it's zero degrees outside, you don't step out and instantly die because all your energy's been sucked away. No, it just means it's pretty damn cold, but it could get colder. So that's why temperature would be where? At least the temperature scares we're used to. Interval, because there's no inherent zero. Right. Twice as hot as 80 is not 160. I'd say twice as hot as 80 would be like 96 or something. I don't know. That's more subjective. All right, cool. Um, so the kind of problems you're going to get uh, would give you like a, a data point. They'd say um, rankings of movie star popularity or something. Where would you put that at? Or no. There could be a little argument about the way that they chose to rank them. I mean, if they use a star system, like star, zero stars mean you suck, nobody likes you. Four stars means you're awesome, everybody loves you. That would definitely be order. There's some inherent order to that, right? Um, if you say that you say uh, 1 to 10, somebody could argue maybe it's interval because then you can see how many spots away somebody is from somebody else. I can kind of go with that. So what I do very often on a quiz or a test is I don't just ask you which one it is. I ask you to explain your reasoning because there are a few that it depends on how you look at it. The number you get when you go into a deli right, or wherever else you go and they give you a number. I don't know. Uh, you all familiar with this? You pull that little tag off. Um, and you got, and they call your number, right? What would that be? Or no? Some people could argue it's interval. interval. If you ever go to Panera Bread, I love going to Panera and Grady. You could say it's nominal because they're not in the order. They just give you some random number, but you're still kind of in an order, right? The order that you gave your your uh, um, orders. Yeah. Uh, so you guys understand that? So I, I try to give. Uh, it kind of sucks here that there's not a clear delineation sometimes, but that's why I give you an opportunity to explain yourself. So as long as you explain it and I say, okay, I can see why you'd say it's this, good. It tells me you understand the idea. Oh. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Um, one little thing I kind of skipped earlier I'll come back to is, is um, the difference between discrete data 
and continuous data. Okay. So the word discrete kind of throws people off a bit. It has a few different meanings, but continuous, we kind of definitely know. Let me start with continuous then. What does continuous mean? Something goes on. On and on, doesn't mm -hmm. stop. It's like you could go 5.6892 something and it would still make sense. Mm -hmm. Good. So continuous data is exactly like you said. Continuous means it doesn't jump. So if I have, for example, weight of a fish that I caught, it could go from zero up to whatever makes sense. What's the heaviest fish? I have no idea. So let's just say, uh, let's just make something up for a second. 100,000 pounds. I love it. Yeah. But it's definitely going to be in there. You with me? And the way I've written it, I guess there could, I might as well include that. I don't know if you guys are, where's my algebra people? Um, what does that mean when I write it like that? That's interval notation. That means that it can take on any value in that continuum, in that interval. So a fish could be 7.182356 pounds. And it makes sense. So continuous, it doesn't mean, if I told you I caught a fish that weighed 8 pounds, is it suddenly not continuous anymore just because I used a whole number? No, it's probably not 8.0000000 pounds. It's probably 7.999432 something. Would it be approximately zero or would you have zero in there? Because like a fish can't be zero. Well, like I said earlier, zero pounds would mean I didn't catch any fish yet. Okay. Cool. That's that's that I understand, but that's yeah, that's how we would look at that. Um, it's sort of like you know, you can say how many doors are in that thing you just built and you're like, oh shit, zero. <laughs> Oops, I forgot to put a door in there. It's still zero doors. You wouldn't say, well, how can you have zero doors? Well, I just forgot to put one in there. Uh -huh. How many fish are in there? Zero. Oh, really? <laughs> I forgot to put fish in there. You know, whatever. Um, so has everybody got an idea with continuous? Not, don't just look at the number that they give you. If, I, if they say it's 14 inches long, you don't say it's discrete because it's not a decimal. You say, well, it could be 14.18659, and it would still make sense. Discrete can only take on certain values. Go back to the doors. How many doors are on your car? Whoa. You're not going to say 3.789. There's 3.789 doors. What's the 0.789 doors? Is that the percentage of the time it opens? No, it's a door or it ain't. A broken door is still a door. Yeah. There was a question on the homework that it was talking about New York City, like the, the push buttons on the crosswalk, and it gave like an exact number. It was like there was 300, there was 3,750, but 2,500 weren't working. And I thought it was continuous because, um, like, what if there's, what if one day another one stops working? Uh, but then the answer was discrete. Exactly, because at any given time, so at any given time there could be a certain number not working, yeah. and there could be at most how many not working. 3,500. Yeah. So at any given time, so she's talking about street lights in New York City. At any given time, there is a certain number, a whole number of them that could not be working. You can't say that 11.5, well, that one's working off and on. No. <laughs> then I'd say it's not really working correctly. I'd count it as not working. Are you with me? Oh, okay. So I agree with you. A s instant later, something else could go crap out. But then at that instant in time, there's one more. You know, instead of 2250, now there's 2251 that's not working. Okay. So it can't take on any value in the continuum, can it? You can't say, I've got 1.8 kids. I'm not coming to your house. It's freaking me out. <laughs> this is a 0.8 kid, right? He's a kid or he ain't. Okay. Why is it okay, though, to say that the average, you know, the family has an average of two and a half kids? That's the average. Averages can do whatever the hell they want to do. They can take on whatever value. Right? Don't don't think somewhere there's half a kid running around. <laughs> John and the little legs are still going, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's more important than that. So discrete data must take on certain values. Very often it's called a finite selection of values. Whereas weight of something can take on an infinite so if you can measure it all the way out, you can just keep on going. And then you plop on one little grain of sand, and now it's the next thing up. It's like you can take on an infinite number of values, truly. Cool. How are we doing? I have been known to be evil on a quiz and say the average um, 
number of doors on a, on the houses in this neighborhood is 7.2. Would that be discrete or continuous? Discrete. I don't care. Again, like we said, average could be a decimal. Don't say, oh, it's a decimal, so it's got to be the dude with the decimal. No. Yeah. Wouldn't the average itself be continuous because depending on the number of houses in the house? So this describes, I like what you're saying, but this describes the data. And we're going to get to the point, the average is an example of a parameter or a statistic. It's what you do with the data. You with me? So you have the idea of data, and you can describe the data itself as being discrete or continuous. And then you have what you did with the data. You with me? So you can say a percentage of people that have uh, four or five TVs or whatever, the percentage could be some funky ass number, but it's still number of TVs. So which one would it be? Discrete. Discrete. I don't care how freaky your TV is, it's still a TV. It's not a third of a TV. It's a third of the channels at one. I don't care, it's still a TV. All right, how do you feel about those two things? Not too bad, right? So don't look at the specific number they give you in the problem. Think about what could it be. Would it make sense for it to be 4.1869, whatever? If yes, good. If no, probably this here. Okay, okay. <coughs> All right, so that's one three. Oh, I wanted to show you. I don't think I'll find it. There was a study a while back. I just tell you about it. You guys tell me what's wrong with this. The, the next section is, is some people love it, some people hate it because it's the common sense section. So let me, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, there was a study that was done that, re, uh, and I think it was in Britain, but I can't be certain. And they posted it up on the web, and a lot of people kind of took it and ran with it. And it was they were saying cell phone towers seem to increase fertility because there's more babies born near cell phone towers. There's more babies around. Them. <laughs> you with me? Yeah. All right. Now some people actually took this seriously. It was a complete joke. They just threw it out there to see what the media would do with misinformation, and, and they didn't even check on the end. They just said, oh, crap, look at that, and they just reported on it. <laughs> Be careful. Right. If you don't have kids, don't get be near cell phone time. So what's really going on? Yeah, cell phone towers are where they are because there are people there. People are often known to have babies, right? But that's the idea. Who knows what that is? is the idea. I, I see a connection between cell phone towers and number of people around there. Uh, um, what is it called? Ca Correlation. It doesn't call it not causation. causation. I like it. Not causation. I don't know what caused what. The cell phone towers, it was erroneously reported that the cell phone towers caused the babies to be born at a higher rate, which is laughable, but there were people that actually took it as real without checking the source. What, what actually is more likely is that the people caused the cell phone towers to be built there. Here's a, 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 an even sillier example from, I think, an older edition of the book. A researcher goes and watches basketball, and he says, oh, wow, short people should play basketball because it makes them taller. Because, <laughs> of course, he observed there's a connection between the people playing basketball and how tall they are. And, of course, not everybody playing basketball is tall. Most of them are, and then you must, must realize, oh, he's short. He must have just started playing. <laughs> Spud Webb, he must be pretty good. Anybody remember Spud Webb? He gave me hope. Because <laughs> I like to play basketball. And when you're short like me, you learn to fade away pretty much. But uh, I had to stop at some point. Anyway, do uh, you guys with me? So obviously, what's going on there? Bless basketball you. milks for tall people. Yeah, tall people would gravitate toward the sport of basketball because they have an advantage. And it's a, you know, there you go. Um, in real life, we see... Um, connections, but there's no way to tell. It's not like, well, of course this. There's no way to tell which one's causing the other one, and there might even be a third thing causing both of them. You with me? So that's why when we see a correlation study, I can't just say, oh, if we make this, let me give you a real life example that really irks the hell out of me. Let me see if I can do it politi politically correct. It's hard for me to do that. Um, there's a school nearby that saw that Students who take statistics uh, go on to transfer at a higher rate than those who don't. You know, that, that reach the level of statistics. You with me? If you reach the level of statistics, you graduate. So they designed a way around the algebra straight to statistics because that would increase the transfer rate of those students, the, the success rate. You with me? 
Yeah, this is a true story. Um, it's been found to be illegal, so it's being shut down. But anyway, um, so they thought, okay, if I, if I can make students go to 160, they will then graduate and transfer. They were misunderstanding causation. The funny thing is it was all about the class statistics. So I'm like, the people in teaching this don't understand correlation causation. What's more likely happening there is that students who make it to that level have shown that they can get to that level. And they probably have what it takes to go further, <coughs> right? You can't just say, you know, um, oh, I can't come up with a good example. But you can't just say, well, statistics makes a student transfer. And, and so let's just put them in there. And then there you go. That's going to work. No, it's everything the student's been through to get there. If they survive it, then that means they probably are going to keep going. How are we doing so far? Good, OK. So um, I won't say any more about that. It gets me upset if I talk about it too much. Um, OK, so there's something else, too, about, um, uh, let's see how I can do this. What's wrong if I report in the paper? If I, if I reported to people, um, there are currently 20,197 students at Grossmont. What might be kind of wrong with reporting that? It's not the greatest example, but. Uh, it gives a deception of extreme accuracy. I like the way you put that. Yeah, it's way too precise of a number. Because the minute I report it, what's what's probably happened in between me seeing the number and me reporting it? Dropping. People have dropped, more people have tried to come in, you know, that kind of thing. You with me? So uh, there's a problem in the book about population numbers in the US. The same kind of idea. You can't be that precise with the number that's probably constantly changing. You can't report it that precisely. Cool. So you'd say there's over twenty thousand or something like that. Okay. Um, See, there's one other kind of problem in here. Well, we'll see if you guys can do that. Oh, OK. Um, what do you think would be wrong? So a way that I think somebody had uh, given the, the, the idea of doing a survey, uh, like surveying students if you wanted to find something out. So you send a survey out, and then you wait for them to mail it back to you. And then you tally it up and you report the results. What could be wrong with that? Bias. Could be biased. Voluntary, that's actually the, the key word there, yeah. Uh, it's voluntary participation. Exactly. So it's what's called a voluntary response sample. So Jeff just slowed way down. He normally talks a million miles an hour, so that probably is a note. Voluntary response sample. That means that. Who normally would respond to something like that? Like if they had a, a talk show and they said, call into the lines and tell me what you think. Who's calling into that damn talk show? people. Yeah. yeah. They agree with them. Interested in the topic. And, and not even people that agree with them. So they definitely have to be interested in the topic. Very often they'll feel one way or the other. Because one side might be more like, you know, I don't think so. And the other side would be like, you're crazy. They're all crazy. <laughs> they're all like, so, so it's the, the idea of the, the uh, silent majority, the vocal minority. right? So you, you take the results that well, the way it should have been. You skew them in the direction of what you believe. So if you have a voluntary response sample, what you're really doing is saying, how do people that would respond to this feel? You're, you're kind of testing the personalities out. You're not getting a real feel for what are the majority of people think. OK. Cool. So the kind of problems you're going to see in this homework, there's a whole section on uh, please tell me a better conclusion, like the basketball makes you taller conclusion. Give me a better, makes more sense conclusion. You with me? There's that kind of problem. And there's a few about what's wrong with the way they did this sample. So if I have people, if I do a survey on, uh, is America Online? They're still out there. Okay, I can't believe that, but I won't. AOL, I do a survey to all the AOL users, and then I report that as being gospel. What what could be wrong with that? There's a certain like audience for AOL. Exactly. There's only some people that are on AOL. You have to have internet access. You have to, and it's also voluntary response. There's all kinds of problems with that. So there will be problems in the book 
just like that. Right? You have to tell me what's wrong with it. You have to tell me what's a better explanation. That's why I call this the common sense section. Right? Uh, okay. So any questions on that? Cool. Um, now we get to kind of a meaty chapter. Section, sorry. <coughs> Section 1.5. And this one's kind of interesting because I have an example from uh, what I taught way back when they had January intercession. I taught a statistics class in three weeks. Holy crap. <laughs> it was crazy. I'm like, you all are crazy. First day, I said, you all are crazy. Let's go. Um, and somebody who was in the Iraq war actually gave me a good example about what we're going to talk about right now. Uh, one of these uh, ways of collecting data. Um, so this is, uh, I don't know, sampling techniques. So remember the other day we talked about how you guys would be a bad sample. If I wanted to find the average age of gross month, you guys are a bad sample. Why? Remind me. I like it. So kind of, it's sort of like the voluntary response. It's going to be biased. Some, it's going to be skewed somehow because of the type of person that would normally take a statistics class this early on this day, all that kind of stuff. There's something that brought you all here. So whatever that those characteristics are would skew the data I see. How are we doing so far? So how can I do a better sample? Can somebody come up with a way to get a better sampling of students? I think we were sort of getting a few things the other day. Uh, collect like surveys from uh, different classes at different times. All right. And especially good if uh, it's not voluntary. The teacher says, you will not fill this out. You will give it back to me. Where's yours? What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> so that's more of a captive audience survey. I like that. Um, and tell me again, how'd you say it? To so do a survey from uh, different, different classes. And different classes. classes. I like it. Okay, cool. Different classes. So if you didn't say the, the last part of your sentence, if you do different classes, that's better than just this class, but it's still that time. You want to make sure you hit some random sampling on Monday through Friday, maybe. I can uh, do that Saturday still. I think we have some Saturday classes, maybe. No. Okay. So there are some cool. going later in the semester. Oh, okay, okay. So do a random sampling from, make sure you got the days represented and the times throughout the days represented. And then you just survey everybody in some classes. I like it. So, so does everybody understand that, that idea? Um, so let me see if I can capture that real quick. Uh, random classes from each day at random uh, all students from those. Dear Lord. All right, cool. So that's going to be exactly one of the methods that we're going to use. Uh, what's a different way we could do it? Maybe? And we have a different way. Instead of doing just statistics, you could do the entire math department, like all math classes. Okay. And that's sort of um, that's sort of like this, except it's, a, it's still a little too specific. This kind of says, I don't care what kind of class it is, because there are certain types of students who might be in math, and we're missing the people that are in no math. You see, so that's kind of like this a little bit, but it, it pulls back. It doesn't really represent enough students. Any other way? One of my favorite ways is to get like. Somehow I get from uh, from the college all the um, student names and just put them up and then just throw darts at it. It's just, mm -hmm. and then you can argue well if you have it, then have different dart throwers and, or throw it differently. You throw it like that. <laughs> behind your back. Have nobody else in the room, obviously. Or just line students up and throw darts. Whoever says Al. No. <laughs> I just have to say. It. Yeah. If you have all the computer records, you cannot use like a random generator. I like so a random generator to pick it out. Of course, now, if I was in the class, I'd say, well, then I just see the ages. And or you can just copy it. all the ages and then put it in to get the average 
talking about their exact yeah. number. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, maybe using a random number generator to pick ID numbers and then yeah. talking to those students. That kind of eliminates the, the that would be a randomization of all students. So I wouldn't have to kind of account for days yeah. and times and classes. You know. Yeah. Something like every every student with the last name that begins with a W and the first name that begins with a T or something along those lines. Neato. And then just everybody yeah. that has that. I like it. And that's actually sort of a different method. So I like that. Everybody who's this would be, and that's actually sort of this method. That's right. Yeah. Um, if you had a, like a, one of the little dust things out of them, like whoever, everyone comes in and you have to go through this kind of like a checkpoint to the star right? Oh, I see. So it's sort of like the forced survey, right? <laughs> I got you. Sort of like when you log into WebAdvisor, sometimes they have a message right there that you have to <laughs> click off of to get going with what you want to do. All right. So let's, let's talk about the different ways. Obviously, the, the most basic way and the hardest thing to really get is random sampling. <clears throat> and that would be most closely... Um, modeled by the random number generator or the darts. And you can argue both of those have problems with being truly random, but give us a break. We're just humans. Um, to be a truly random sample, what must happen? So let me let me give you an uh, example. If I picked, well, let's see. Um, if, I, if, if I wanted to know my students' average age, my student's average age, right? And I picked a, one person from each row and one person from the back. And that would be my sample. Uh, that's not truly random because it's it's leaving somebody out, anybody who is not here right now. Right? So what's really wrong about that, though? If I call people and I ask them a question, that's leaving out the people that don't, don't have a phone. If I ask a question on the internet and say reply to this and tell me what you think, that's leaving out people that don't have internet access. So what's wrong with that? Why is that not truly random then? Doesn't cover everybody. Doesn't represent them because not every person in the population had a chance to get into the sample. So to be truly random, every element in the population must have an equal chance to get into a sample. Now there is a further subclassification of this that I really don't want to get into because I don't care how well I try to explain it, it seems like I can never get everybody on board. I think we're all on board in this. It's kind of jives with what we kind of intuitively think. There's another one called, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, called simple. Simple random. Exactly. And my example just a second ago would, would be a random sample if I picked it one person for every, every row and then one from the back, and you're in this row. Is that random? <coughs> No. Why not? Because you leave out the type of people that would sit in the middle or people who aren't here. Well, one from each row, right? You're doing it. Yeah. Let's say everybody's here today. So let's Probably. pick out the, yeah. Thanks for reminding me about that. Everybody's here. If not everybody's here, holy crap, i got to get some more chairs. Uh, you, might <clears> have, you might accidentally have personal bias in it? No. I truly randomly select because I have a multi-sided die. All right? And I truly randomly select students from each row and one you know, one from each row and one from the back. You with me? Yeah. I, I've heard students say, like, I'll pick you randomly, I roll a dime as you. And then they say, well, she didn't have a chance. Yeah, she had a chance. She didn't get into it, but she if, if I pick everybody, what the hell's the point of a sample? <laughs> so I often have students say, well, you didn't pick her. Well, no, she wasn't picked. You were picked. Everybody had a chance. That's the point. It wouldn't be simple random. Simple random says every subgroup of people in the population has a chance to be the sample. This is where people really freak out. Could everybody in this row, could this group be in the sample? No. Why? Because the way I'm choosing, I'm taking one person from each row. Therefore, that method would be random 
not simple random. <clears throat> That's all I'm going to say about it for right now. Doesn't really make, doesn't really come into play until chapter seven anyway. So if you didn't quite get the idea. That's fine for right now. Okay. Just want to lay the seed. Um, the next type up from random would be systematic. Just the word systematic, what does that seem to mean? Yeah, some kind of ordering. Like a formula to it? Like a formula to it, exactly. So if I was on an assembly line and I picked every fifth radio to see if it works as a quality check, that would be systematic. Would it be a good way to do it? You guys, so I'm in the radio factory, right? My old job. And I'm picking every fifth radio. It would definitely be random because what's the? F I could have picked the first one or the second one or the third one. So they all actually have a chance. With the first one, then I would pick the sixth one and the eleventh one. With the second, it would be the seventh and the twelfth. So they all have a chance depending on where I start. Really? So it's random. But what's wrong with that? It's, it's systematic, right? It's systematic. I'm doing every fifth one. But what's wrong with that on an assembly line? If I do every fifth one. You've come to a point where you're actually just following a pattern. It's not. No, it's fine. Completely random. Still. That's okay. It's, it's it's that's perfectly fine. And, pe and I understand what you're saying. People have trouble with that, but picking every fifth one is still random because you randomize where you start. Right. Mm -hmm. Everybody still had a chance based on what I picked to start with, so it's still random. But it's more than random. It's systematic. Well, the quality of the what you have uh, predicted or what you have uh, taken, you should check uh, for the, the quality of, of what, what kind of the, the machine that you are taking, the quality, they are different. One is good, one is bad, uh, so that you can look at the percent all. Maybe, maybe, if you have a situation like an assembly line, I always think that there's machines doing little things or people doing things, and maybe every fifth one for some reason, I always picture like the old cartoons where they would cap the bottles, and then it would turn and cap it, turn and cap it. Maybe the fifth little cap dude is broken. So every fifth bottle will be not right. So if I'm quality control and I go, let me start checking. That's not right. Or uh, that's not right. Oh shit, everything's wrong. Oh shit. So if I have a possibility of uh, periodic problems, like s the, the, the issue itself shows up every whatever time, I'll either totally miss it or I'll only get it. So it might come out and my sample might look totally good or totally bad. You with me? A little bit? So another example of systematic would be that a cop uh, takes the speed of every fifth car going by. Uh, I take the temperature reading every 10 minutes. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? So it's got to have some kind of system to it. Every this, every this many people, every this many minutes, whatever. Cool. Um, how are you guys doing? You holding on? Mm -hmm. Like I said, you gotta have a little stamina to make it through chapter one. Um, so we got systematic, random, systematic, and then we got the two biggies here. We have, I'll put them up here at once. We have um, cluster and stratify. So these two start off the same way. And actually, one of them is this, the one that example I got from you, I think, right? One of them is this. They both break the population up into subgroups. Like I broke, if you're my population, I broke you up into rows. With me? So if I just do that, you don't know which one, the, which one I'm talking about. So the first step for each one is to break things up and the subgroups. So for this example here, we broke it up into groups of uh, classes. We broke the whole um, school up into classes at different times, in different days. So we, we kind of broke our population up. Nobody pointed out here that I could possibly pick the same person twice, right? 
which actually, come to find out, is fine. We'll learn more about that in chapter 7. Chapter 7 seems to be the bigger one. Um, so you're with me so far, right? So I break my population. One reason we might want to do this is if I'm in a high school and I want to get the opinion of students and I have 8,000 freshmen and 500 seniors, if I randomly choose, I might not end up with any seniors. And then if I'm a senior, like, you didn't represent me. <sighs> so one reason you might want to do this is you break it up into freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and you pick like 10% of each group randomly. You with me? So then you have representation from everybody. Okay. That would be stratified. Stratified breaks it up into groups and then takes some from each to be my sample. So the key phrase there is some from all or some from each. Yes, but wouldn't that, um, so say one of the groups had a larger population than the other, and if mm -hmm. both of them are equally represented, wouldn't that kind of skew, skew the... Uh, well, you yeah. can choose to do, it's called proportional sampling. Oh, yes. so you, you could choose to do it or not. So, so um, would you do like eight for the little group and then like 16? For exactly. The, okay. Yeah, something like that. Or you could choose not to do proportional sampling. Because what he's saying is, wouldn't that over-represent the smaller population? And that kind of sounds to me, if anybody's taken any American history recently or American government, it sounds like our government, right? <laughs> we have two different houses in Congress to represent the two different ways to kind of do these things. Interesting. Um, so stratified is, take some from each, some from all. Cluster is this, take all from some. Pick a few classes and take everybody. So the real quick story about the Iraq war. I like that. That's a neat intro. Real quick story about the Iraq um, So I had somebody in my intersection, I think it was like six years ago. Yeah. And he told me that there that he doesn't trust cluster sampling because he knows from experience that cluster sampling is a bad way to go. It always comes up with bad data. And I said, could you explain further? And he told me that soon after they went into Iraq and they captured Baghdad, they sent in teams of uh, people to see how bad the neighborhoods were. So they broke Iraq up into sections and they applied cluster sampling. They took everybody, which kind of makes sense. You don't want to go into a war zone and hop all over. You want to get somewhere, talk to everybody, and get the hell out of there. Right? What was wrong with it was they didn't randomly select their sections. They chose the sections that were safe to go to. Right? I can't really blame them, but then you can't report the damn things you find. If you're trying to see how neighborhoods are coming along and you only go to the safe ones, you might have skewed data. So I, I, tried, I think I got them to understand it's not Cluster sampling is not bad if you apply it correctly. Right? What they did there was they applied it incorrect. Cool. How are we doing there with that? Oh, cool. Okay. All right. Let me see. So how I feel about those two things. Those, those are easy to mix up. I was thinking like clusters, like you get those nut clusters in, 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 uh, in uh, cereals. So I eat some. I eat. I pick this one, this one, this one, and then I don't want to eat that to you, right, or something. Stratified to me is like, I don't know, I always think about strata, different geology. Anybody into geology at all? No? All right. Forget it. So whichever way you want to remember these two, they're very similar, so we got to be careful. And the last worst way to do it, to collect the data, is convenience sample. Right. right now, it's probably one of your favorite words. The last way to do this is like the word last, Jeff. Stop talking, please. So, what do you think convenience is? We get one to see. Yeah, you guys would be a convenient sample for me if I'm trying to talk about gross month students' ages. That almost always comes up with a bad, skewed data. Even if it didn't, I'd have to disregard your findings. So we, you, um, that's why I like Gallup.com. 
because it explains their methodology, how many people do they talk to, what do they try to control for. You know, you're always striving for random. We'll never get purely, totally random, but we always try in a study, we always say we did this and we did this and we did every damn thing we could, right? This, I throw it out when you look at it. It's crap. You might have luckily happened on the right answer, but I don't know. It's convenience. It's probably skewed. So this is like standing outside a music store and asking people's opinions about music. Do you like this song? Do you like this song? They're obviously going to have strong feelings some way. I mean, that's going to be skewed. It's convenient for you just to stand there. Oh, to come out here and buy a CD. What do you think of this? Right. It's very convenient, but it's not going to tell you anything. Cool. And there's one last little thing think that I've, okay, that's all. Um, one last little thing I want to talk about, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what's going to happen in chapter two, and then we're going to head out for our um, uh, field trip. All right. um, and that's the idea of statistically significant versus practically significant. So if you started the homework yet, you probably run up against some of these questions already. Have you ever heard of something like, uh, we found it to be statistically significant findings? Right? You hear that sometimes on Mythbusters, actually. I think I asked a few of you guys if you've heard Mythbusters. Adam gets all excited. It's statistically significant. Yeah, he says that sometimes. You know, which thrills me a little bit because I'm a sad ski. But uh, statistically significant means, let me, let me see if I can really get you guys to understand. Um, oh, here we go. Perfect example. Let's say you wanted to uh, find, you needed lumber. So you got to lumber. It needed to be cut to a certain length, right? So you say, can you cut a few and let me check them out? And he says, we always cut it perfect. We always cut it perfect. So he asked for it to be 48 inches long. And they cut like 10 of them. And you measure them all. And one of them is 47 inches long. One is 49 inches long and so forth. So it averages out to be 48. Um, but his claim was he always gets it to be 48. So that is, your findings are statistically significant. If he is not lying, right? If he's not lying, what you just did is really unlikely. What you just saw, uh, let's see if I can come up with a different example. Um, let's say somebody claims that they can, they can guess your weight. To uh, within how many pounds? Five pounds. Right. So you say, all right, guess these guys' weights. And they guess it, and they get every single one is uh, off by, or most of them are off by like six pounds, seven pounds. That's far away from their claim of five pounds. You with me? They said they could do it within five pounds. So that's statistically significantly different. It is really unlikely that their claim is true. All right, let me try again. Uh, uh, let's see. Any sample we take, can we 100% trust what it says? What we find? No. So if you claim that, uh, let's do this. Here's a good one, close to your hearts. If you claim that Mr. Waller uh, fails more students than he should, so he fails, you know, 80%. I don't. But let's just say some points. I think you fail 80% of people. Uh, any sample I take could agree or disagree with that. So if I just take a sample, I could happen to pick a sampling of students where none of them fail. But I still, maybe I do fail 80% of my students. Let me, let me say this again. If, uh, are you guys kind of coming up here with me? Let, let's go back to the ages. Let's say I claim that the average age in this class is 23. And I take 10 students at random and their average age is 30. Is that impossible if my claim is correct? My claim was that the average age is 23. Are you with me? And I take 10 students, and their average comes out to be 30. Is it impossible if my claim is correct? Is it likely if my claim is correct? If the average age here is truly 23, and I take a random sample, let me make it a bigger number, a random sample of 20 students, and I'm saying the average age in here is 23. And I take the average age of the 20 students I've selected, 
randomly, and it comes out to be 30. What do you think about my claim? Most likely not true, right? Can you say that with 100% confidence? No. no. But you found statistically significant evidence that I am full of crap, right? That's the way I look at it. You have a claim that somebody makes. Oh, yeah, I can cut your lumber, right? I take a sample, and I'm like, that's far away from what you said. You're full of crap. That's statistically significant evidence. What it really means is that the, the probability that my claim is right, given that the sample had an average of 30, is really small. You still can't say I am totally 100% wrong, but you can say it's statistically significant. It seems that you are wrong. How you doing? The really sucky thing about statistics is that you can never say anything with 100% certainty. The really beautiful thing about that, though, is this is the most honest math class, right? It says, oh, shit, man, it's life. I don't know. I can't say for sure. People hate it, but it's like, that's freaking life. Like, the plus or minus. You ever see the polls? 47% uh, want to go for Romney. 45% want to go with Obama. What do you always see at the bottom? Plus or minus 5%. Yeah, plus or minus 4 or something. Yeah, exactly. Oh, they're just covering their asses. No, that's the math. You're going to see it in chapter, again, chapter 7. You're going to see where that plus or minus number comes from. You're going to see the equation that spits that thing out. That kicks ass. And that's, that's the math of statistics saying, shit, dude, I don't know. <laughs> Why does it always have to say that? Because we never have the entire population. We always base what we see on a sample. Not always, but that's really the heart of statistics is get a sample, try to say something about everybody. Right? Mm -hmm. OK, cool, cool, cool. All right. So like I said, um, shoot. I'll tell you what. Let's do this for 10 minutes. I want you guys to uh, work together on something real quick from chapter one. We won't get to chapter two here yet. We'll get to chapter two next time. How many of you guys have books? Can you raise your hand? All right, cool. Um, so what I want you to do, if you want to get together with somebody, to try to tackle this out. This is kind of like a review of chapter one. Just dealing with all those definitions we just